and I'm delighted to uh, be here today um, and to speak to so many um, friends, former colleagues from around the world. Um, thank you very much to the OECD for inviting me and indeed for uh, coordinating this debate. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a couple of things, the economics of excessive pricing um, and then some thoughts on a policy response, although obviously policy responses will depend very much upon the, um, the legislation uh, in, in each jurisdiction. And I want to be clear right from the start that I'm not going to play the role of the stereotypical economist who simply says, well, high prices are just the market equilibrating supply and demand, so leave them alone, let the market sort it out. Clearly, governments are intervening right through the economy at the moment, as they should at a time of crisis. Uh, you as competition authorities are receiving complaints about excessive pricing, um, and you are um, under pressure to respond. You cannot simply ignore those things, uh, nor indeed, I think, should you, because uh, as I will explain in some, in some situations, quite possibly many of those uh, complaints have a great deal of merit. So, um, so as I said, I don't want to just um, do the, the, the stereotypical economist thing, but let me start at least by doing the economist thing. And we should remind ourselves that high prices are not necessarily bad. Uh, prices have all sorts of functions uh, in the economy as signals um, and as incentives. Why would the prices suddenly rise in uh, a crisis such as this? Well, one reason might be costs going up and we're all pretty much okay with that, I would have thought. But the other reason is when there is a sudden scarcity, could be due to a supply fall, but is more likely sudden increase in demand, such as the increases in demands we have seen for uh, medical and personal protection uh, equipment. What happens then? Well, the, the, the solution in the medium term, when demand exceeds supply, is obviously a supply response if the demand uh, remains high. So demand, the supply increases and that sorts out the scarcity. But in the immediate uh, impact of uh, a demand increase like that is to cause a sudden increase in price. And then as supply increases, that, that, that price will come back down again, possibly to a higher level than pre-crisis, but certainly not at the level of the initial price spike. And that initial price spike might be general in the marketplace, or it might be a few individual companies taking advantage to put up the price very high indeed. Um, so the problem is one of scarcity. The symptom uh, is one of high prices. Uh, that does not mean we should not address the symptoms, but if there are ways in which competition authorities can help to deal with the underlying scarcity, then obviously they should take them. So that would certainly involve prioritising any cases against companies which are actually actively reducing supply in some way or colluding to do so. It might also involve uh, advocacy work to government to, um, to relax regulations temporarily or permanently that could be preventing entry into an industry and thus enabling supply to increase. So there's things that can be done to address the underlying concerns, but that leaves us with the high prices. You're facing pressure to do something about them. How do you assess which ones you should try and do something about and which ones you should leave alone? I think the, the fundamental answer there is to, uh, is to take some guidance in this health crisis from the medical uh, profession itself and adopt the Hippocratic principle that first of all, you should do no harm. Uh, and by that, I mean that the competition authorities intervention should not in any way reduce the supply response uh, that you really want to solve the scarcity uh, in the crisis. And that involves thinking through uh, what sort of things might be involved in a supply response and whether any kind of intervention you take might, uh, might stymie those, might, might make those supply responses less likely, both in the long term, thinking about innovation, and just in the short term with increased production. So do no harm. If we look at the current situation, uh, you're obviously familiar with uh, the complaints you have doubtless been bombarded with. I don't have any insight into that. From what I read about from public sources, I understand that a lot of complaints concern situations where, for example, somebody has bought up a bunch of masks 
something like 10,000 masks or something like that, and they've put them on eBay at 10 times the normal price. These are the kind of concerns uh, that, that we have. What to do about that sort of situation? Well, I might be in danger of losing my Economist Union card if I say this, but it seems to me that the harm from intervening against that sort of behavior is, is slight, um, if there is any at all. It seems to me that there is relatively little merit in those high prices when it's somebody just reselling products. They are not themselves innovating. They are not themselves producing. Uh, does that high price from somebody just selling that small supply on eBay send a good signal to companies to increase production of masks? Well, possibly. But I would have thought that companies are getting pretty strong signals to increase production of masks, uh, even, even, even without those sorts of price spikes. And indeed, I would guess, and this is just a guess, that in any case, what companies are really interested in if they're thinking about turning their production lines over to masks or hand sanitizer or other products that we suddenly need so much more of than we used to, is whether actually they've got the volume certainty of a sustained increase in demand to make it worth their while doing that, uh, which has really nothing to do with somebody just spiking the price uh, on eBay or wherever. So I would suggest that many of those kind of cases, the, the sorts of concerns that economists rightly bring forward uh, about intervention to control um, high prices are unlikely to be particularly relevant. Obviously, you shouldn't take my word for it because I know nothing about the economics of mass production. Like in any other competition case, you should make sure that the company is under investigation or any interested party has the opportunity to explain to you what they are doing and why they are doing it uh, and why it is uh, not harmful and so on. That is very important, not just as a matter of due process, but in order to get to the right answer. So, I'm not opposed to those sorts of actions against high prices. I don't think economic analysis necessarily suggests that it, it, it is harmful. But let's not kid ourselves about what can be achieved. If the government is saying to you, you've got to stop these price spikes, well, you may or may not have the powers to do anything about that, but it's not going to solve the underlying scarcity. Price, high prices is a way of rationing goods. Uh, it has certain economic advantages. The goods go to those who value them most but it has certain economic disadvantages as well. And in particular, the people who value them most as expressed through their purchasing behavior may well simply be those who, are, uh, who can most afford to buy the products. That has distributional effects. The rich get the products, the poor do not get the products. It is not at all unreasonable for a public authority to have a problem with that. I have a problem with that. But if you are not gonna ration by price, there is going to be some other form of rationing. It may be formal, it may be informal. But if demand exceeds supply, then somebody who needs and wants those products is not going to get them. That might be completely random. When this crisis started here in Europe, for some reason, a lot of people decided they were going to run out of toilet paper. And they went and, and took those off the supermarket shelves. So the shelves were empty. That's a kind of random uh, rationing. The people who got to the supermarket too late didn't get any. Then the supermarket started rationing. They started saying how many toilet paper roles people could buy at any one time and so on and of course you could have uh, more formal government rationing but some form of rationing is required if you are not going to allow a price mechanism to, to ration products and, and let's be aware of that I just want to touch briefly on the sorts of instruments you might use. Uh, the trouble here is that um, obviously legislation in different jurisdictions is different, especially for the treatment of excessive pricing. There are huge differences globally. Famously, of course, the United States and Canada do not have uh, uh, excessive pricing as part of uh, federal antitrust law, although in the United States there certainly are price gouging laws at state level, but those are very, very different indeed from what we normally think of as competition law with very different um, evidential requirements. W one thing I would say, and this is perhaps a slightly Eurocentric point, but I think there are still some Europeans on this call because Europe is, is halfway between the time zones, um, and that is that excessive pricing under abuse of dominance, Article 102 and its national equivalents in Europe, is relatively unlikely to be a useful solution to the sorts of problems we see. Um, it's going to be very hard indeed 
to prove that someone in the kind of situation that I've talked about before of exploiting a situation by whacking up the prices of masks, reselling them on eBay or something like that um, is dominant. It is possible to argue it on economics grounds. If they've got some kind of pricing power, then they might temporarily be operating in a small market. They might temporarily be dominant in the sense that an economist understands that. But I think that would be so far away from the conception of dominance and market power as recognized in precedence in competition law that any competition authority launching a case right now could find itself in a couple of years still fighting that case. The abuse of dominance cases are big and they're tough um, and, and trying to argue in a court of law that this company um, back here during the crisis was, was dominant. That could be very difficult indeed. So in conclusion, I think you do need to intervene um, against um, exploitative high prices, uh, depending upon what your local legislation allows you to do. Um, I would suggest that competition authorities ask themselves every single time, is there any possibility of my action actually reducing um, or preventing a supply response to this uh, scarcity? And indeed ask other people, including the parties under investigation, whether there is that sort of possibility. Don't just rely on your own intuitions um, about the market. Um, and then what instrument you actually take will, will very much depend upon your local situation. But I would have thought that the heavier instruments of competition law against monopolization, against abuse of dominance, those may be extremely difficult and not even appropriate to apply in, in, in the sort of complaints that I understand you're getting. And those considerations shouldn't be any great surprise because they are exactly the same considerations you should probably be applying in normal times, uh, normal times that I guess we all hope will return as soon as possible. Thank you all very much. Thank you.